Shalom. Welcome to the Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabad House of Dalmar. Together we have a very special guest to us, the Josh Sussman. As you can see, he's a violinist. You can see it for yourself. And Josh, welcome to the Jewish View. Thank you very much. Great to be here. You know, really, it's the Jewish View, and it's a violin, and really they do go hand in hand. It seems, uh, maybe you can explain it, that so many great violinists in the past century and the 20th century were were violinists. I mean, you don't see trumpet players so much. I'm just saying, you see a lot of violinists that were, were great violinists that were Jewish. True enough. Um, so, in, in the early 20th century, um, being a violinist was seen almost as a ticket uh, to uh, a more comfortable life. Uh, some of the um, Jewish people in the um, old country and in Europe were. So you could say even disadvantaged, and the uh, violin was seen as a way to um, rise up from from that uh, circumstance. And yeah, you, you really do see so many great Jewish violinists. Um, of course, very famous Yitzchak Perlman. Um, Yasha Heifetz was probably the greatest violinist of the 20th century, a um, famous uh, Jewish Lithuanian violinist. Um, Isaac Stern, and the, the, the names just go on and on. Yeah very interesting the, you know the violin but you know I know a lot of Russians even pulling it today you know they come from Russia and they say oh I'm a great I mean I feel bad for them I'm a pianist I'm a violinist and where is my job right you, know, you talk about you know raising themselves up I said sorry you know there's all all many symphony here there's how many violinists you know there's just not jobs true and uh, maybe they can teach but you know they think they're going to be Take world off. famous, but it really in America, it's a shame because I mean, surely there's symphony orchestras, and we are blessed in the capital district. You know, surely in the summer you have Tanglewood, you have Spack, that people could, uh, you know, see this. But on the other hand, I mean, it's they don't need a thousand violinists. You know, True it's, enough. It's um, so, uh, in the United States, uh, maybe schools and communities place a lot of. Um, uh, emphasis on athletics. So your uh, extracurricular activity after school, people, uh, young people get involved in sports, which is also wonderful, very important. Um, in Europe, even to this day, a, uh, their community's choice extracurricular is music or um, you know learning an instrument, um, becoming involved in an orchestra, chorus. So you do have a lot of um, immigrant communities coming to the United States who are very skilled in, in the arts and, and music. Yeah, it's, it's hard to make a living though, that's for sure. True. Listen, let's get into a little violence, get our viewers a little music. What do you want to play first? Okay, um, so uh, a, a famous um, violin piece that practically everybody knows from the uh, Broadway stage. Um, why not play a little bit of uh, Fiddler on the Roof. Oh, that's my favorite. All right. Okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Pleasure. that someone gave me they know like I told say fiddler on the roof they know I'm a real Jew that loves fiddler on the roof <laughs> but um you know they sent me a copy and then of the original score of the music 
And then I saw it was like, it wasn't just like, it was a Broadway play, they got some guy. It was Yusuf Perlman who played the real, uh, the original piece, and it was so beautiful, and, and you know, like, so, so I'm not degrading you by, you know, your professional <laughs> violinist. To Thank play. you. I mean, <laughs> Yusuf Perlman could play it, I'm sure you can also. <laughs> Listen, being, being in the same sentence with Yitzhak Perlman, it sounds great to me, so thank sure. you. <laughs> but you, this is Broadway, which is beautiful. What about the classics? Sure. Um, <coughs> so... Nothing like the classics nowadays, are there? I mean, it's just compared to real Beethoven, Mozart, I mean... It, it happened to be that in the uh, 18th and 19th centuries, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, there was a, a very large focus on, on uh, musical endeavors and artistic endeavors during the Enlightenment in Europe, so um, you had a uh, a flurry of, of great musicians, great composers. Um, are there people today like them? Most likely not, um, but uh, certainly there, uh, classical music is alive and well, and um, we have the um, Albany Symphony here, the Schenectady Symphony here. Um, there are things going on, and uh, we, we treasure what, what we have today as well. Maybe because, like you say, there's no emphasis on it. Everybody's playing the electrical guitar, and they're not thinking about classics, so no one's into it. Sure. Maybe um, that's an answer. Yeah, in, in the public schools, it's not uh, quite as uh, emphasized as it even used to be in my uh, my parents' generation. Um, they had uh, electives, and there was a, an emphasis on uh, artistic development also. These days, maybe it's not quite as uh, much a focal point. You see, the kids, uh, you know, I just had my grandson live with me, and, you know, I told him, start playing the piano, you know, just music. I mean, my parents also, I mean, I'm no great musician, but I might say I was the first French horn for my uh, high school band, really, and I played piano. But, you know, music was really uh, an emphasis, and I don't know if it is today. Right. Maybe I'm um, wrong. I don't know my statistics. I don't know. Sure. Uh, uh, I myself, my, my two children um, play the piano. They have lef lessons every week. Uh, we have music on in the home. Um, and that's also how I grew up, is music is a part of life. You have music on in the home and you uh, go out and listen. I think it's a major part because um, on the Jewish year we have so many different people and like we say, the Albany Symphony Orchestra, we have the Pale Theater, the practice, you know, that they're bringing really in SPAC, like I said, in Tanglewood. And um, really, um, I always, my pitch always is you need the arts. Uh, you know, community, yeah, oh, we need jobs and unemployment's always the big headline. But really, to have a real society, you need to have the arts. You really do. And, um, um, it adds something that uh, says that people are, are beyond just what they, you know, what they do nine to five. Obviously, we know that uh, the nine to five life is a very, very important part of our, our lives and, um, you know, adds a lot to our um, culture, our, our society. But people are, you know, on, on the off hours. What, what are we doing here, you know? So, um, yeah, the, the arts definitely speaks to that part of our lives. So what do we have? Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so an, another very famous um, melody, um, this is a, a classical melody. Um, this was written by what historians like to call the greatest violinist who ever lived, um, Paganini. Um, and many different um, pieces have also been written based on this melody. Um, Brahms and um, Rachmaninoff have all based pieces on this melody by Paganini. <laughs> people out in our audience <laughs> and our viewers that Thank are all you. clapping. 
Thank you. When did he live to Paganini? I didn't even... You know, it's interesting. I never heard that he was the greatest violinist ever. Yeah. Um, Paganini was born in 1782 in um, Italy. And he was so great. He was so uh, virtuosic on the violin that there was a rumor going around in, in high society that he had sold his soul to the devil. Really? <laughs> <laughs> um, that uh, uh, it was practically impossible for a human being to attain such a uh, uh, height of virtuosity. And the slightly younger romantic um, composers of, of that day were enamored by his level of skill and they were influenced in their own, uh, let's say, uh, piano playing or their own composing to emulate his, his wizardry. Excellent. So move up to the 18th, uh, 1800s. That's when would he have Beethoven and Mozart? Um, yeah, so uh, Beethoven was uh, a young man and got his education um, still when it was the 18th century. So um, he learned with um, Franz Josef Haydn in the Vienna of the 1790s, but uh, really his maturity, people say that his uh, major maturity um, came with the Symphony Number no. 3, the um, heroic symphony um, in E flat, and um, that was right at the beginning of the 19th century in 1803. So you could say that uh, really Beethoven ushered in, musically ushered in, um, the 18th century and kind of the Romantic movement. Excellent. Yeah. you have anything from Beethoven? Of course. All right, there you go. Sure. Um, so probably Beethoven's most famous tune, his most famous melody, um, from the Ninth Symphony. Every, everybody knows it. That's how famous, famous it is. It's the Ode to Joy. of these um, symphonies on violin, usually you need a whole orchestra, right? I mean, it's... Right. Um, you know, uh, what I'm playing mostly is the, um, the main themes, the, the major parts that kind of um, jump out at the listener uh, because they're uh, most brilliantly orchestrated for, or um, they're the leading, leading uh, tunes, but of course, to get the full impact of the of the music as the composer intended it, you would um, hear it on on full. in a full orchestra. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm just saying it's interesting how they make a full orchestra and you can play it on a violin and get the <laughs> the essence of what's happening. Sure. What's the next composer? Give okay. Us a real bio, okay, through the history of uh, music and violinists <laughs> in a half hour, that's pretty good. Sure. Um, so you have. In the, in the middle of the uh, 19th century, actually a, a very famous Jewish composer named Felix Mendelssohn um, lived. He, he was the grandson of a, uh, a famous uh, Jewish philosopher, uh, a German philosopher named um, Moses Mendelssohn, a uh, famous figure in the German Enlightenment. And uh, Mendelssohn wrote what is likely the most famous of all violin concertos. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So um, Mendelssohn wrote uh, his e, mi e minor violin concerto in uh, the early 1840s. I think it was 1842. And uh, yeah, th this is a piece that 
all violin students play and, and practice and uh, eventually perform. So um, I'm going to play a, a melody from the first movement of the violin concerto. Um, this is where the um, texture takes a, a turn toward G major. It's the, the, the main part of the first movement is in E minor. It's a very stormy piece. So here's a, a little respite um, in G major. applause from one person <laughs> over here, but all right. That's I'm fine. representing the thousands of people <laughs> who are watching our Jewish view and applauding. Thank you. So we have Beethoven, Mendelssohn. Okay. Um, perhaps the most important uh, violin concerto, a large violin piece for violin and orchestra to come after Mendelssohn's may be Tchaikovsky's. Um, violin concerto that was written in um, the late uh, 1870s and at first it was um, dedicated to uh, another Jewish violinist in the um, uh, late 19th century named Leopold Auer um, one of the great teachers of the violin really of all time in fact um, the figure I mentioned earlier, Yasha Heifetz, was a student of Leopold Auer in, um, in the Russia of the uh, early 20th century. So Leopold Auer looked at this uh, piece by um, Peter Tchaikovsky and said, impossible, no one can play it. I'm not even going to attempt it in public. And then later on, another uh, violinist named Brodsky uh, learned it, tackled it, and uh, made it famous. So um, here's a, the famous main theme from the first movement. <laughs> schedule these days so I don't get to um, teach as much as I'd like or even perform as much as I'd like um, it's uh, more of a uh, casual type of
the things. I certainly uh, love it and, and I enjoy it very much um, when I do get the opportunity. Um, what I'm focusing on most musically right now is writing. I'm really? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm in the middle of a um, very long and in-depth um, academic paper on, of all things, 15th century music. So, uh, Piques that's your interest? <laughs> it does, um, and it, it's just taking a lot of my uh, focus and energy to, uh, to, to, to work on that. Um, and after I'm done the paper, I'm looking forward to playing more chamber music, playing more um, orchestral music with, with local groups. Chamber music, let me ask you about that. When it was like a certain period of time, because I like chamber music, but I didn't know exactly the history of it. Or it was right, only in the it was older than the orchestra. Um, yeah, so chamber music has really been a um, a, a parallel art and a parallel interest for musicians um, to um, orchestral music. So you have chamber music and orchestral music being written concurrently in the 18th and 19th and 20th centuries. Um, chamber music really m means nothing more or less than um, musicians playing one instrument to a part. So in orchestral music, you have many violinists, many cellists, ma many uh, double bassists um, playing one part. So you might have upwards of 10 musicians playing the exact same part. Um, the definition of chamber music is that you have one violinist playing the first violin part, you have another violinist playing the second violin part, one violist, one cellist, and so, so forth through the wind and, and brass instruments. Is there special music composed by the, for chamber music? or it's Definitely. Um, you have um, string quartets, you have wind quintets, um, trios with piano, and even uh, sonatas for solo instrument with piano. And there were uh, composers who were very focused on only chamber music. Um, Haydn, uh, as I mentioned before, wrote something like 68, 70 string quartets um, alone. Um, certainly Beethoven is the uh, quintessential string quartet composer who wrote um, 17 string quartets. Uh, and other musicians focused more on uh, winds and others on brass. So there is a very wide range uh, and varied range of uh, chamber music. Play us anything right now? Sure, right? sure. Um, you know, I, I've also um, taken uh, a deep interest all, uh, all through the years in um, Jewish music and specifically in um, Hasidic music. Oh, very good. Yeah, um, and uh, I'll play a, a Hasidic melody. Um, it's a it's a real favorite of mine, and it has to do with um, singing and making music uh, as a form of of spirituality. So, Excellent. yeah, um, and the metaphor that the composer uses is um, weaving, weaving melodies for, for our spiritual growth and our pleasure. Um, so this, this Hasidic melody has to do with um, that, that uh, uh, process of composing like weaving. Excellent.
know, I could hear you all day over here for hours. Thank but we you. only have a few more minutes. So maybe you have one more Hasidic little tune for us to end off the show. It's sure so thing. beautiful. I could just sit here for hours, <laughs> but the, the show's for a half hour. Thank you so much. Um, sure. Um, this is a melody that um, is set to the s psalm, one of um, D King David's psalms, uh, number 72. And uh, it talks about, it, it makes a metaphor, again, uh, between um, spiritual energy and almost um, blooming like flowers. Right. Beautiful. Judge Bagot, like I say, sit here the whole day uh, listening to you, and um, you know, you brought the Jew with his fiddle, but I mean, you do a lot of different variations, the Jewish music, classic music, so just invite you again on the Jewish view, but I'm sure there's more music you. in your repertoire, of course. and uh, we wish you a lot of success and uh, enlivening people and uplifting people with your music. Thank you so much. Um, th great to be here. <laughs>